this talk seminar presentation asks the question what is punk ethnography uh, it's not an original term that i've i've come up with um i think james letson is here he's got an email address that is punk ethnography at gmail.com so he's he's cornered that one there's also a book that uh, was published in 2016 called punk ethnography which i'll discuss in a moment um but it's basically a reflection on the uh critical methodologies that I, i've kind of been working with or, or been uh, led towards over the last uh 10 years and more and, and how i view that as a practical development and an on ongoing development um i'll tell you a bit about all of that and then at the end we will uh point forwards to um to look towards um the new project uh, which which Robert mentioned, field states and creative resistances, and talk about how I want to. Um, uh, sorry, just going to admit some more people into the room, and how the the um, things I've been thinking about so far are going to feed into that research project going forward. Going forward is a very corporate term. I apologise. Uh, so I'll talk about punk ethnography, punk methodologies, and punk um, punk epistemologies ways of gathering knowledge and the reasons for it. So this is all fluid and contingent. Um, that, that's kind of part of the methodological approach anyway. So uh, any questions or comments that you do have, I really welcome them. Uh, they'll help me to continue to develop my approach. Uh, and if there's something that you're doing that, that kind of echoes the things that I'm talking about, then um, I, would, I would love to um, hear about that. Two more people coming in. Had a few minutes past, disgraceful. Okay. So before I start, I mean, I really should just acknowledge that sticking the word punk onto the front of something um, isn't a particularly original thing to do, um, especially in, for academic terminology. People seem to love putting the word punk and then an academic word. I think people get a bit of a, a, a thrill out of it um, because uh, it's this juxtaposition of the edgy, cool term punk and this dry, turgid formality of, um, of academia. Stephen Baker's coming in now really late. <laughs> um, so maybe there's something to that juxtaposition where you take the kind of um, radical um, meanings associated with punk and, and attach them onto an academic term, and we'll talk about that. But it has been done really, really often, um, and sometimes with an absolute lack of radicality. Sometimes the application of the word punk has been decidedly unpunk. Um, so there, there's a need and some work to be done to reclaim that punk prefix or that punk suffix from some of these uh, appropriations or, or misappropriations of the term. So move on to the second slide here. Several screens on the go here. All right. So hopefully you're seeing a whole bunch of um, colourful pictures. Um, and these are all cases where the word punk has been prefixed or suffixed onto some other existing concept. And this is just some of them. There are, there are loads and loads that are out there. But I think maybe by overviewing this uh, range of examples, maybe we can get to some kind of understanding of what it means when you put the word punk uh, before or after another term. So we'll just work across these. Um, top left of the screen here, we've got Punk Sociology uh, by David Beer from 2014. Um, this is basically a short manifesto, and in that, uh, Beer wants to shake up the field of uh, sociology. And uh, um, sorry, more people coming into the room late, but never mind. So they want to shake up the field of sociology, uh, and, and this is an analogy, essentially. Oh, can we? Product launch is easy. Everybody can mute. Would be great. Uh, is everybody muted? Sorry, I'm trying to done two things at once here. <laughs> okay, back to the presentation. So with David Beer's idea to shake up um, sociology, uh, this is basically an analogy of what punk rock did um, for, for the music industry in the 1970s. It shook up the industry. Um, punk archaeology uh, is the next one across there, also from 2014. Um, this book does something very similar uh, to what David Beer proposes, but in the field of archaeology, obviously. Um, it's a kind of a, an iconoclastic uh, clearing away of the old guard. And, and maybe that's particularly poignant 
um, in, a, in a field of study that is literally dusty and old as archaeology. But the main thing we can take from both of those books is that they take punk uh, seriously. And in some academic circles, that's still an uphill battle. Uh, so that's a contribution that, that shouldn't be overlooked. The next one along there is uh, an edited book called Punk Pedagogies from 2017. Um, Mike Dines from the Punk Scholars Network is one of the editors there. And this is a collection of punk informed analyses of education, as you might expect. Again, there's an iconoclastic aspect to this. I think that's evidenced in the book's cover as well. Uh, but the key point here is that punk pedagogy wants to make a critical contribution to the field of education. Um, punk Ethnography, as I mentioned at the start, this is a really interesting book. It's not actually about punk at all, which is maybe the most interesting thing about it. Um, and in, in this book, they uh, uh, ask um, participants in, in the book project um, to, um, to, to reflect on the uh, Sublime Frequencies record label. It's a world music record label. Um, and that there's a critical discussion there that's centered around the activity of producing records and all the processes uh, that extend backwards and forwards from that uh, in terms of distribution and gathering music uh, and the entire industry. Um, so I'll discuss that uh, more in a minute, uh, even though it isn't actually about punk. Um, the one on the right hand side at the top is Punkademics from 2012. Uh, that's a book edited by Zach Furness, and again, it revels in that kind of shocking punk academic juxtaposition. But, and, and there's kind of a, um, a basic argument in that book that says, actually, punks aren't thick. Punks aren't as stupid as you think they are. Um, but that, that's actually more important than it sounds, because what it gets at is that punk culture and the questioning mindset that people acquire through their involvement in punk, it actually provides people with uh, skills of critique that enable them to do really good research, whatever field they might find themselves in. Just to say, there is a slide at the end of this presentation with all the full references of these books, um, if you want to go and look at them further. So moving away from uh, these particular book titles then, in the middle on the left hand side, of the slide, we've got punk rock operations research. Um, and this is, um, as it sounds, it's operations research, a pretty dry field perhaps, uh, but it's punked up. Um, it's got a cool logo. The researcher, um, whose name is Laura Albert, uh, wears punk t shirts sometimes. Um, but that's kind of it. And this is, I think, an example of the limitations. Of, of sticking the word punk onto the front of something um, because it's actually decidedly uh, unradical and unpunk. Um, the researcher, uh, Laura Albert, has taken money from and done work for the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of the Army in the United States. So I don't care what your interpretation of punk is, I'd find it hard to um, marry that with working for the Department of Homeland Security and in the Army in the United States. So, um, so in this case, that, that punk rock bit at the start, it really just refers to this aesthetic, this logo, it's an adornment, it's a bauble, and it doesn't seem to have any actual bearing on the research that's happening. Uh, punk rock anthropology, if you can just about read it beside it there, this isn't actually about anthropology at all, it's really disappointing. Um, it's just a, a blog about um, music and, and fashion. There's, um, some interviews, some gig reviews and so on. It's basically an online magazine. So that's a disappointing one. Um, Punk Scholars Network, I, I mentioned Mike Dines is one of the founders of that. It's, it's by now quite a, a, a massive international network of people who are um, researching punk. Um, and that includes uh, cultural historians or ethnographers and sociologists, people who are doing music studies, literature studies, uh, you name it. Um, from all over the world, um, the people there are involved in the punk and post-punk academic journal, which is in its 10th volume this year, and they do a series of edited publications on Intellect and University of Chicago Press. And the whole idea of that network is to fight for a space in the world of academia 
to study punk and have it taken seriously. And as I noted at the start, that is not uh, always an easy thing um, to, to achieve. A lot of um, other academics simply don't take it seriously. Um, and I think this is especially important for scholars and academics in the global south. I think in, in, in the UK, in the US, in Europe, there's been sort of f upwards of 40 years of, of getting serious punk study in the academy, but in the global south, that, that's still an uphill struggle. So that network does really important work. Uh, and I think that it's, it's a great, um, great organization. So to move down to the bottom left, uh, we can see Richard Branson's face. I'm sorry to have to show you Richard Branson's face. Um, this is a German language magazine called Business Punk. Um, just to give you the blurb of that, uh, of that magazine, it's the business and lifestyle magazine for men who want to change things and enjoy success. Yeah, so uh, you two can be like Richard Branson and oh, look, he's sticking out his tongue. Oh, watch out, capitalism. Uh, and the, uh, the blurb on the front here reads uh, in German, I break rules. So it's kind of this um, disruptive neoliberal business model, uh, business model of capitalism. And Chris is having some problems getting in. Sorry for the interruption. Um, but basically, yeah, that's, it's that disruptive model that you, you hear a lot from Silicon Valley tech giants. Um, if, I, if I wanted to give that a generous reading, maybe that's some kind of the iconoclasm that we saw in um, punk sociology and punk archaeology. But uh, I'm really not feeling very generous to Richard Brunson's face, so we can, we can just move on. Uh, beside that um, is another book, uh, Punk Rock Entrepreneur. It's from um, 2016. Um, this book is actually, um, I think it's quite damaging because what it does is it takes the, the punk DIY ethic and it debases it and twists it into a, uh, a neoliberal entrepreneurialism. And I think it's more damaging than the likes of, of business punk uh, because it, it actually does reflect the aesthetics and language of punk and then twists it and debases it. So whereas business punk is this juxtaposition, which is kind of doesn't really work and you're not convinced by it. There almost is something more convincing about punk rock entrepreneur, but it fails to acknowledge the exploitative uh, aspects of capitalism that undermine their entrepreneurial argument. So it's all about you can do it and hard work pays off, but it ignores the exploitation that's inherent to, to uh, capitalist business. So it's, it's quite damaging that one in my view. Uh, Punk IPA, maybe some of you have had this, it's a beer, um, the flavour is described as spiky, so therefore it must be punk, it's uh, brewed by um, the Brewdog Brewery, who were founded in 2007 in Edinburgh, they talk about doing craft beer for the people, they have a Brewdog charter, uh, and like business punk they want to blow shit up, um, the regular sell off equity under the headline of equity for punks, and they, they try to present themselves as being socially progressive and all of that. But I think despite this big show of an alternative business model, they have engaged in some nasty business practices and they've been criticised for doing so. But it is a very nice, tasty can of beer, I must admit. Uh, Pizza Punks, just below that. Um, this one makes me a bit cross too. You can see the circled A there, which has been turned into a pizza slice. Um, it's, it's just blatant appropriation of, of punk culture and punk aesthetics. They, um, they do have extra vegan options in there. So maybe there's something we could say with that. And, um, you know, they have some wacky toppings, like you can get vegan haggis on your pizza and, and all the rest. But really, it's just purely um, an identity gimmick. And, and there's nothing radical about it. Uh, the branch in Belfast opened in 2018. In, uh, in the cultural quarter, and uh, maybe that location tells you everything you need to know uh, about this, about this um, company. So I feel quite dirty after talking about a lot. We'll, we'll move on to some nicer things. Um, other concepts which have punk in front of them. We've got this one, punk time. Um, basically this just means that people are gonna be late. Gigs are gonna start late. Um, but it could be viewed as a kind of anti-bourgeois, anti-work, um, sort of critique of punctuality and timekeeping and the kind of uh, um, the, the tyranny of the clock that comes with industrialization. Um, 
the other one there, George Bush's face is the logo for the Punk Voter campaign. Uh, this started in 2004 and the idea was to, to get George Bush out of office. Uh, I think it um, was it John Kerry they were trying to get in that year. Obviously it failed, he was re-elected. The project was half-heartedly rekindled in 2008, although Bush was you know, at the end of his fixed term anyway. Uh, but I think when Obama came in and the reality of his continued international aggression, I think that really killed off that campaign. There are precursors. Jello Biafra ran for mayor of San Francisco, I think, in the 1980s. But, uh, but again, it's a juxtaposition, right? You know, um, punk's main political association is anarchism. So to attach it to uh, electoralism is a juxtaposition. Um, two examples on this page that actually uh, do feed into the, the, the way I'm thinking about uh, punk ethnography are punk ethics and gyne punk. Uh, punk ethics is a, a, it's a group that's loosely informed by anarchism, but they avoid the label. It started in around 2016 in London, and the whole idea is to um, re-energise and, um, uh, and re-engage the, the, the political aspect of the punk communities, especially in London. Um, and they um, try to uh, get people to stop buying um, sweatshop made clothes. There's kind of a uh, a consumer consumption focus there. They're closely associated with the, with the No Sweat campaign. Uh, but this, this campaign extends beyond that kind of mere consumerism uh, because they actually work with uh, a, a t-shirt producing company in uh, Myanmar and they get people to, to source their, their t-shirts there. It's, it's a workers cooperative in Myanmar uh, and they get bands to produce their merchandise through this. I mentioned the critique of Brewdog Earlier, uh, punk ethics have been some of the main cri critics of Brewdog. Basically, Brewdog tried to, uh, they issued a cease and desist legal notice to, to a, a pub in London who wanted to use the, the word punk in, in the name of their, um, their bar or, or one of their beers. And Brewdog said, you can't use the word punk because we have uh, legal copyright over the word punk. Uh, and a punk ethics popped up and said, you don't own punk, the punks own punk. And that's an important uh, intervention into that appropriation of punk and that's something I'll talk about in terms of methodology. Gyne Punk is uh, a really brilliant initiative uh, by some cyber anarcho-feminists in Catalonia. Um, they started off in about 2013 and they they hack medical technologies and they make them freely available via open source to anybody so you can uh, 3D print um, the, the image here is a little centrifuge for separating out, separating out bodily fluids. Um, you can 3D print a speculum, you can 3D print a microscope, all with the idea that you can take back control of, of the, the medicalization of our own bodies. It's in our own hands. So they're, they're anarchists, as I say, and uh, DIY is a key principle, do it yourself. Although the way they phrase it and the way it's often rephrased these days is as do it together, DIT, which emphasizes the, the collectivity and mutual aid that underpins that. And that, that's an important development because it defends against the appropriation of DIY or DIT by the likes of punk rock entrepreneur. So after looking at all of those, um, what does it mean when you put the word punk or onto the front or onto the end of another word? And maybe it doesn't necessarily tell us much. Some of these groups are kind of uh, diametrically opposed to one another in some ways. Um, sometimes it's just an aesthetic. Uh, sometimes it's this iconoclastic attitude. Sometimes it's about doing things for ourselves, but maybe across all of these, despite the variation, maybe it's, it's this idea of a, a critical intervention. People identify problems with how things are being done and they set out to do something that's, that's different to that, whether that's inside existing institutions or outside of them. Okay, we'll move along to the next slide now that we know what punk actually is. So what, what does it mean then to say punk ethnography or punk methodology or punk epistemology? I'll draw on two other uh, punk prefix suffix ideas uh, and they will be punk anarchism and queer punk. So punk anarchism uh, is distinct amongst the spectrum of anarchisms for, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and I think all of these 
things that make punk anarchism distinct from other anarchisms. Um, you could extend those in, into this kind of uh, epistemological uh, and methodological extensions. So iconoclasm, we mentioned it a lot in the first place. Um, uh, as with those other sorts of iconoclasm, iconoclasm punk anarchism has a, a disregard for the for the old guard of the the anarchist movement and, and all the kind of gerontocratic um, hierarchies that that can imply and i think that um grounded theory in terms of methodology because of its emph emphasis on theory development that's immersed in the research field actually has echoes of that iconoclasm um basically grounded theory um explicitly does not rely on pre-established theories. It goes into the field and develops theory from there. So I think that's an, a kind of iconoclastic attitude um, that makes grounded theory quite a good fit with punk anarchist epistemology. Spiky, confrontational. Um, so we talked about interventions and we talked about the spiky flavor of the beer. Um, in terms of academia, I think this is expressed as hostility to the academic establishment and hostility to outsider academic research. Um, so punk communities are, are, are conscious that they're often misrepresented in academia and in media and wherever else, and they challenge that. So punk research and especially punk anarchist research um, will be by the punks and for the punks. Uh, punk anarchism is also characterized by culturally focused activism. And of course, punk is much more than just a music culture, but those cultural aspects are the lifeblood of the movement. You know, without, without that culture, there just wouldn't be a, a punk anarchist movement. So that means that creative methodologies are uh, particularly well suited to researching punk because they fit with the every, everyday activities of punks and they reflect uh, this core medium, this cultural expression that's in punk. Um, I'll also talk about object-oriented ontologies later on. Uh, this is actually something that, that's been new to me since attending the um, uh, Centre for Media Research seminars. It's come up in a few of the previous seminars. Uh, and basically, the way I'm thinking about it is that these punk objects, the commodities, whatever they are, are actually, they're actually crucial to the perpetuation of punk culture. And these objects um, can be a, a research opportunity. So I'll discuss that more. Uh, in, the, in the final slide. Revolutionary personalism. Um, this is a, a, an old anarchist idea if, um, um, with proponents like Gustav Landar. Uh, and the idea basically is that individual transformation, individual revolution is the, the necessary precursor to cultural and system systemic transformation and revolution. So it's quite distinct to uh, Marxism or Leninism in that regard. But as such, it means that the everyday is a key site of knowledge and of experience and therefore of, of research. And that obviously has echoes with uh, feminist epistemologies. DIY and DIT do it together. I, I discussed already in terms of the punk prefixes. Um, this echoes with the, the militant ethnography that characterizes uh, anarchist epistemology. So. Uh, Uri Gordon, in his 2007 um, thesis, highlights that in anarchist theory, there is a close relationship to its author's activities as militants. So anarchist epistemology values activist experience. It's a do it yourself or do it together philosophical tradition. And there's a clear resonance with, with punk there. That also leads into this discussion of uh, insiderness and insider critique. So insider critique stems from that emphasis on militant ethnography that merges with that uh, spiky punk hostility to outside interference and misrepresentation um, but i think there, there's something of a need here in terms of epistemology to uh, create a critical distance um, basically it's hard to analyze and critique anything when you are deeply embedded in it when, you, when you're too close to something you can't see it um, so for me, I think the way to do that from an insider uh, perspective in punk is to tap into the existing auto-critical tradition that animates punk. Punks are already arguing about all this stuff. All you have to do is find a way to 
latch onto that and represent it and, and uh, explore it. Um, so being an insider grants, uh, grants privileged access to that dialogue. So, you know, stemming from that militant ethnography emphasis of anarchist epistemology, this, there's, there's something perhaps essential about being an insider. Uh, and that's a contested term, but I think it's an important one. Okay, we'll move on to queer punk or queer feminist punk. Have a drink of water, let you digest. Ah, refreshed. So a key aspect of uh, queer punk is interventionism. So that's coming back to do it yourself or do it together. It's about doing something. There's an activity, an intervention, right? Um, queer punk uh, intervenes um, or is an intervention in several respects. It intervenes in the wider punk scene with criticism that punk often feels to be sufficiently radical in terms of sexual politics, despite the, the radical sexual politics that are, that are there from the start of punk. Uh, but queer punk also intervenes in what um, uh, Maria Wiedlach here, uh, she terms it homonormativity and gay liberalism. So it's this idea that, um, that radical sexual politics are being recuperated within a uh, very un unradical mainstream and queer punk is there to, to intervene in that and re-radicalize uh, 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 sexual politics. So it's kind of, uh, to, to use an anarchist term, it's kind of direct action in research. You intervene uh, to embody, to make the transformation that you want to see. Uh, another term for this is that it's prefigurative. Um, so we're building the new world inside the shell of the old, to quote the IWW. We're not waiting for a post-revolutionary utopia. We're living the revolution right now, as far as we can, to, to, the, to, to the extent that we're able to. So in terms of research, um, the, the research that is of punks and by punks and for punks can make a critical intervention into those scenes. Um, so as much as you're tapping into a dialogue, you can also intervene in that dialogue and change things. Um, so it's kind of uh, uh, action research, participant action research, and there's a rich field of methodologies there to draw on. Insider critique, uh, the quote here is from Mariam Bastani. She was the uh, coordinator of Maximum Rock and Roll fanzine when they still did physical distribution in the early uh, 2010s. And she said, when it comes down to it, if we don't write and critique our own history, it's only a matter of time until other people attempt to do that, do this for us, uh, which is definitely happening. So, um, so it's back to this insider position of privileged access um, and, and the deep understanding that comes with that. And in the spirit of interventionism and, and that hostility to outsider interference and misrepresentation, this is research that is by the punks for the punks. It's punks researching their own scenes, their own communities, and their own movements. And this chimes closely with indigenous epistemologies uh, and the research methodologies that stem from that. So Linda Tehuay Smith asks uh, eight questions that, that should characterize, that you should ask when you're thinking about indigenous methodologies. Um, so those questions, I'll read them out here. Number one, what research do we want done? And, and the we is important there. That's the group who are being researched. Two, who is it for? Three, what difference will it make? Intervention. Four, who will carry it out? Five, uh, how do we want the research done? Six, how will we know it is, it is worthwhile? Seven, who will own the research? And eight, who will benefit? So those eight questions that, that Smith asks, um, I think in, in the case of punk and this insider research, you can boil it down to two key concerns or two key uh, um, ideas that, that should lead you in, in your, the shaping of your research or I've shaped my research anyway. So the first is that research processes should be dialogical. And that goes beyond uh, simply giving voice. You know, the idea in grounded theory is that you give voice to the research communities. Uh, this goes further than that because it wants to involve those voices in the analysis and the critique Okay, so it's not just gathering people's voices and then as an academic expert, you go off and analyze it. These voices are considered to be expert um, by virtue of their insiderness. Okay, and the second bit is that research outputs should be um, accessible 
uh, to those being researched and they should be useful to those being researched. So I'm gonna uh, stop sharing the screen just for a minute and show you hopefully some of the, the, the zines that I put out um, over the years based on uh, the ethnographic work that I've done. So all of these zines um, have been published over the last few years. They've all started out as um, academic pieces of work stemming from academic research. And um, most of them have been published in academic journals or as chapters in academic books. Um, but as we all know, those are typically hard to access. They're expensive, they're behind a paywall or people just don't know about them. So that, that, that would feel in, in terms of making these research uh, outputs accessible to and useful to punk communities. So punk fanzines are a key communicating organ of, of punk culture. And that's what these things um, really hope to do. Um, if I look at one of them <clears throat> in particular, um, I'll come back to this in a second actually, but a key point is that in all of this research approach, um, th these are explicitly value laden. So I, I wouldn't extend this research approach to uh, right wing social movements or cultures. I couldn't because I would be an unsympathetic outsider. And, and there are critical questions about which groups we deem as being socially progressive or right on. And, um, and that's especially interesting in terms of funding. Most research funding comes from the state or from corporate philanthropo uh, philanthropic institutions, and they have particular concerns and particular agendas. So when you're thinking about this kind of research, you, you need to uh, be aware that there are difficult questions there, especially when, when you're thinking about funding. So yeah, this is the um, war zone dialectogram zine. I'm going to talk about the war zone dialectogram quickly now. Uh, basically, this is a uh, big fold out version of the creative research that we did. So a big A2 fold out. This is a smaller version of the dialectogram. Um, I'll, I'll share a website link where you can see an online version of this. But basically, it was a big piece of creative ethnography. I'll share the screen again and. Uh, I'll show you some of this. So if we go on to the next slide. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see there some of the details, basically it's a lot of um, a big uh, A0 ground plan of a social space, in this case, a punk social center. And um, it was a collaborative, co-productive piece of creative research. It was inherently dialogical um, because I did, uh, interviews and then clips from those interviews were then written on to this dialectogram. So the voices and the dialogues are there. Um, it produces, represents a collective identity of the, uh, of the Warzone collective uh, and, and the creativity um, feeds into and, and reflects the creative practices uh, that, that are going on in the Warzone. So we did a couple of exhibitions. Uh, we've got the zine as I, as I showed you all the proceeds from distributing that zine are a benefit for the Warzone Collective. So not only is it uh, useful and accessible that people can read it, but the Warzone uh, Collective actually uh, benefits materially from this project and, and it's available online. Methodological fit is another concept to bring out here. Um, in the Sounding Conflict project that I was doing at Queens until recently, we worked with a community music making NGO and it was, we tried to fit the research into their activities and, and ethos. And that was a really interesting challenge. Uh, and with the Warzone project, um, the, the, that, that resonates in several ways. So it's a practical fit because of the creative methodologies, as I mentioned. So this research activity um, augments or complements the every act, everyday activities that the, the punk collective are, are going through. And it chimes with that emphasis on interventionism uh, there's an aesthetic fit. You know, the, the dialectogram looks like something from the war zone. The original document actually smells like the war zone center. Somebody spilled beer on it. It stinks. Um, so that's what the war zone center smelled like um, and uh, reflects that collective identity. There's an objective sharing fit um, because this project was carried out in the months before that social center was evicted and the center was demolished. So the collective wanted to... to um, uh, record the, the social history of this space and that's what this project did. There's a, a research service there and there is an ethical fit. 
that's basically everything I've been talking about around these anarchist epistemologies, the indigenous informed methodologies, and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a punk and anarchist informed way of doing research with a punk and anarchist informed collective. And basically, um, it wouldn't have been possible to do that research in any other way. They, they, they just wouldn't have allowed it. So to finish up on the, this is the final slide, final substantive slide, there's all that stuff, um, but how am I going to take it forward in, into the next thing? And it's here especially that I would um, appreciate your, your, your comments and questions. So the, the new project, uh, which should be starting in a few months time here at uh, Ulster University, is Field States and Creative Resistances, the Everyday Life of Punks in Belfast, Banda Ace, Mitrovica and Soweto. So it'll be uh, non-exploitative, dialogical ethnography. Uh, there'll be a focus on useful research outputs. So we're going to uh, produce, I think, almost everything as, as a zine. We're going to translate it into all the local languages. We've got all the funding for that. Great. We're, we're going to do all that stuff. But there's also um, building on... So the, the kind of core of it is still the, um, the, the, the standard ethnographic methodologies of interviews and uh, participant observation. <clears throat> but we're going to build on that as well with uh, and augment that with a creative and, and innovative, innovative approach. And that'll be in the form of the group curation of 12 inch record compilations from each place. Okay, and this is going to be the basis of uh, dialogue across the four contexts. So each scene, each place will make a 12 inch record. Uh, and then we'll um, share that with the other scenes and they'll be heavily annotated, like, uh, short essays with them and so on. And the other groups will be able to comment on what the other people have produced. Um, so this is kind of like, a, this is the compilation record is like a shared language of punk culture. Um, as I said, the, 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 the cultural production is, is the key linchpin of punk. And by tapping into that, we're, we're tapping into a shared language that people will understand across these scenes. Um, it also gets across a collective identity. That's what the, the curation is about. They're curating a collective identity on this 12 inch record. Um, the Agit Disco project, the book came out in 2012, is a, is a great example of that. Um, in this, Shelton gets uh, 23 groups to curate playlists of CD length. And, uh, and the book reflects on those processes and includes all the artwork that they did for it. Um, and actually that, that limitation that, that Shalkin has in the CD and that this will have in the 12 inch record is crucial uh, because there's just such a mass of media and such a mass of cultural production that it, it's kind of meaningless if you just put it all out there. And it's the process of curating these, uh, uh, these playlists and these records that that's where the critical discussion takes place. Object oriented ontology, as I say, is something that I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think through and it'll be about following the life of those compilation records as objects as something more than just a commodity um the punk ethnography book that i talked about at the start uh edited by veal and kim 2016 um they they look at the sublime frequencies world music label and there's that emphasis on on the cultural production processes so that culturally focused activism is a key part of punk and punk activism and this means that this approach makes a very strong methodological fit uh, with the research um, communities that we're looking at. And that's a, a, a practical fit, an aesthetic fit. We've got a shared objective in terms of producing and sharing music. And uh, there's the, the wider ethical fit here as well. So just to give you a couple of quotes from the research proposal, uh, talking about this, this particular aspect of the methodology, this approach provides opportunities for groups to express a collective identity that's tied to their indigenous punk musical aesthetic, their cultural production, and their creative resistance subjectivities. And this me methodology then is closely tied to creative resistances, and it emerges from everyday practices and the critical dialogue of the punks themselves. So that's just about 40 minutes, and hopefully in there, has there been some kind of answer to the question of what punk ethnography is? I don't know, maybe. You tell me. Um, here are the references. Um, if you want to uh, 
get any more details on any of these, just drop me an email at the email address at the top, jim.donahay at ulster.ac.uk. And there's a list of website links there as well. Uh, just to say that bottom one there uh, links to where you can buy the Warzone Dialectogram Zine. It's 150 plus postage uh, to get a hard copy version. And all the proceeds from that, as I say, go to the Warzone Collective. There's not many left, but if you have a look there, uh, you can uh, you can buy it there and support Warzone. And uh, the link above is an online version of that that you can explore at your leisure. <laughs>